Hello, hello, hello. Can you guys hear me okay? Would you pray for a little louder, or this is okay? This is okay, yeah, we don't want to be too loud. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Hello, welcome.
Good? Okay. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming all the way out here to the foreign land of Harbor Walk. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see you. And I am so happy to present tonight's artist, Gian Her. Um, I met Gian about eight and a half years ago at a residency called the Vermont Studio Center. And um, for me personally, that residency was really pivotal. I made all these great artist friends that I've kept in touch with all these years and collaborated with. And um, right now, I curated a show at Redux Contemporary Art that has Gian's work in it. And then also another Vermont Studio Center alum, Hannah Barnes, who's in the back, um, who was actually a visiting artist down here before all y'all's time. Um, but um, so I hope you'll come down to Redux and see the work in person. The opening is this Friday, um, 5 to 8. But the exhibition is up until October 30th. So please come down. There's be a beautiful installation. Um, really focused on um, actually how Charleston, um, how integrated the water in Charleston is, um, and kind of personal stories around water, and then, um, and then Hannah's paintings, which are very rigorous. All of you in painting classes, I want to see what some laborious, rigorous painting can look like, um, and also how it can be very beautiful. Um, come check that out. But. Um, Yan is an interdisciplinary artist and educator whose experience as an immigrant daughter deeply fuels her practice. She recently completed Stove Works Residency, which is in um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, Bronx Museum um, AIM Fellowship, and Dance Space Project Writer in Residency. She's the inaugural recipient of the Hudgens Prize. Her works have been featured in Hyperallergic, The Cut, Art in America, Art Paper, Sculpture, Art Asia Pacific, Public Art Magazine Korea, and more. Um, let's see. Um, and she's contributed as an artist writer in Floromancy, The Brooklyn Rail, and The Forget Tree. Um, Born in South Korea, she moved to Georgia at the age of 13 and currently lives in Brooklyn and teaches at Parsons School of Design. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce one of the most thoughtful and creative and kind artists that I know. And thank you so much for coming here. <laughs> Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Well, thank you, Susan, for such a kind introduction and also just an opportunity for me to share my work and where my heart lies with your community, Char College of Charleston. I'm grateful for your invitation and, um, again, for me to just to share where my work is at the moment and has been and what my journey has been like with you. Um, so. And I'll just kind of start. So often in my work, I think about creating or constructing an emotive landscape that can hold two opposing things. Um, I think often in our lives, on a personal level, right, that we are also asked, life demands us to hold contradictory things without being able to find any kind of resolution, right? Finding answers. Um, so this is an image of my most recent uh, solo exhibition in New York at a place called Wave Hill, and it's titled So We Can Be Near. And with this particular project, I was thinking about two opposing things, beauty and loss. How do I simultaneously hold these two contradictory things at the same time. Um, so quickly, just to describe what you're seeing here in the image, on the wall, there are 12 hand-blown glass vessels that hold two bodies of water, Hudson River that runs through New York State and by Manhattan, and also Delaware River. 
On the floor, there's a vinyl. The bluish floor that you're seeing is a composite of a total of 15 images that traces my family's migration story through landscape from South Korea to Atlanta, Georgia, to Tennessee, to New York. Um, and the yellow that you're seeing are hand-shredded silk flowers that I um, been working with. It's actually my signature material that I've been working with for about 10 years, and I will talk about that a little bit more. And along the edges of the gallery space, I also held up mirrors, and the mirrors, behind the mirrors, I hand etched hundreds of lines so that it can kind of mimic the imagery of the river. And then the wooden structure you're seeing they serve as a structure that holds the mirrors, right? But also as skeletons or bones of the installation that exposes what's underneath and behind. Um, when I start to think about a project, especially the installations that are site specific, I usually start with a very simple sketch and uh, a lot of like impromptu writing. Um, because English was actually a language that I had to acquire, it took me some time for me to get there, but I end up just writing impromptu prose or fragmented sentences that comes out of my heart um, in response to my own life and also the site, the place where I'm gonna be actually installing. So this project was going to be actually happening in 2020. It was proposed in 2019. So um, I did a site visit, and I was taking a train down back to the city to go home in Brooklyn. And I ended up sketching, writing. And I didn't know that pandemic COVID-19 was about to unfold, right? Um, so, so much took place for those one and a half years, collectively and also in my personal life. So, work needed it to and naturally shifted. Um, but the intention of me wanting to create like an introspective space where people can come and pause with hints of yellow light was still there. But you can see that from my mock-up and sketch, what has remained and what has shifted with some final images of my installation. Um, so because the site where I had this installation was actually at this place called Wave Hill. It used to be a private estate, beautiful garden by the Hudson River. Um, it used to be a private estate by a very wealthy family. And every time I went there, because it was so beautiful, right, um, I started to think about who gets to own land and why do we tend the land, for what reason? Um, the imagery that you're seeing here is um, my mother-in-law's garden in Chattanooga, Tennessee. She's Cambodian Chinese American. In 1979, after Vietnam War, there was a genocide that broke out in Cambodia. So her family was hosted in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and that's been her home since. And what strikes me is every time I go and see her, the way that she tends her land, now that she calls home with grace and resilience. And her imagery was always there whenever I visited Wave Hill, right, and seeing their gardens. And um, another thing that I was thinking about is also how my mother-in-law, as an Asian American diaspora, right, immigrant woman, entering into this southern landscape and American narrative. And I, it's, it's quite amazing how the southern landscape seems to hold both incredible amount of lusciousness and beauty, as well as trauma for generations. Um, and she kind of entered into that, right? Um, so that's an image that I end up integrating in the project. And also these two images. In the winter of 2020, I went up to upstate New York and Narrowsburg, and I spent a few days on a personal trip, um, just you know, spend, spending some time away from the city, and I spent a really intimate time with Delaware River for the first time. This was a view uh, of a little Airbnb I got, and I was waking up to this view of the river, 
And during those few days of me spending time with the river, I was really stunned by the way that it was teaching me the movement of letting go. This particular choreography of what grief may look like. Um, and that ends up becoming part of the imagery that I use on the vinyl. So the image you're seeing on the left is a prototype of that initial floor image. It's very, you can't really see it here. You can see it in person a lot better. Um, but so in the prototype, you, the little pinkish figure that you're seeing, it's hard to see it on the projector, is my mother-in-law. I'm kind of putting her as kind of the goddess in the installation and the landscape. And the Delaware River and then the sunlight and all other imageries of landscape of my family's migration is all embedded in that montage. On top, I put yellow hand shredded silk flowers. Um, so on the image on the right is titled Flower Girl, and it's an eight hour performance that I did during my graduate school. I've been collecting and hand shredding silk flowers for about 10 years. And my initial discovery of the silk flowers was actually at the cemetery. Um, there are often those silk flowers that people go and put for the beloved ones, right, um, to remember and honor. Um, they're often discarded after rainy or windy day, they get plucked out. And because the cemeteries don't know where to put them back, they throw all of those out. So during my graduate school years, I got a permission to collect them for one and a half years. And my, stu my studio started to fill up with all these flowers, and I kind of needed to figure out what I was going to do with them. And, um, and one thing that I also really love about these silk flowers is they're so artificial, right? And they defy this particular notion of decay, and I find that pretty fascinating, especially when my work speaks to loss and very fleeting nature of life. Um, perhaps I have this romantic notion that things can last forever of the things that I have lost, right? Um, so this idea of foreverness really allows me to, um, well, the artificiality of the flowers allows me to enter into this notion of foreverness, right? Um, the process of collecting and hand shredding silk flowers are extremely long and laborious. And the resulting pigment-like material embodies this particular notion of invisible and unforgiving labor. And I think I have the relationship to that as growing up as immigrant daughter, seeing my parents kind of working as an invisible labor workers. Um, I approach my work this way, just sitting down on the floor, cutting the flowers for hours and hours, because somehow it makes sense to me with my body with my psyche, um, materially, it also really speaks to me. And as I shred these flowers bit by bit, um, I change their origins, their forms, and their values. And there's something to this um, process of me spending so much time with these materials that they get really tied to my body and as I transform the materials to very unrecognizable material, right, that once actually looked like or mimicry of flowers um, or nature, that I find a lot of power in that transformation of materiality and something seems to alter in my psyche as well. Um, the imagery of rivers have become quite important in my recent body of work. Um, there's like a beautiful river nearby this building and also Charleston is full of these river waters and I just been really just stunned by that. And, um, you know, not only it was teaching me this particular choreography of grief that um, I really le had to lean on, um, it's also, the rivers are also provider of life. It's incredibly powerful. It remembers the past and the present, you know, um, and as I was doing some research on both the Delaware River and Hudson River, I found that, you know, especially the Delaware River, Lenape people actually really flourished around the river. It was their livelihood. That's where they got their life and, you know, all resources of lifeline. 
And um, it used to be called Lenape River. And after the colonization, um, after European settlers kind of settling in Manhattan, uh, the names have changed and context and history have changed all together. Um, also, as I was doing some research on river, I was reminded by this particular reference to river baptism in the South, right? And this kind of healing aspect of what water can hold for me, for my work, for me on a personal level, uh, was something that I kind of like grabbed onto. Um, and you will see that how much I am able to then translate that locally here in Charleston and finding just the references and beauty and context and history with the rivers here. Um, Another beautiful reference that I found during my research was um, this particular object called lacrimatory. So I was working with this amazing glass artisan to create these hand-blown glass vessels, right? They can hold river water. She told me about this funerary object. It's a glass vessel. It's a Victorian object. And what this is is when the mourners, um, during, during the time they grieve, they would collect um, and store their tears, theoretically, and maybe in a real thing, as a real thing, in this lacrimatory. And the idea is when the tears are all evaporated, um, that your grieving uh, period is over. And I just thought that this idea was so absolutely beautiful and I was also reminded of a performance piece that I did 2008 um, when I mourned and wailed for seven days um, thinking about the losses of my past. So this is a detailed image of hand-blown glasses. It's very simple. It's in shapes of tears, or many people see it as raindrops. And we just kind of created a hole on the behind, on back of each tear, and we um, so we can insert water, we can pour out water, and they're being just gently held by you know, nails on the wall. And it's holding, um, in this case, Hudson River and Delaware River. As I was thinking, you know, I, so choosing to hold river water came towards the end of my installation phase. Um, something told me, and I'm sure you may experience this in your work, where you're working, working, you have the idea, initial idea, you know what you're doing, and then somehow the work asks you to kind of like be open to something more. And um, something really kind of like told me, and I felt really urgent that I needed to have the presence of river water in my installation. But I didn't know how to hold the river water this thing that evaporates, that's impossible to capture as an object, how am I gonna do that in a beautiful way that's accessible? And I was taking a walk in the park early in the morning and I was just reminded of, I purchased the book of Kiki Smith, Retrospective, and she has a particular piece called Tears, um, made in 1994 out of glass. And I just, that imagery just popped and somehow it made sense how I could interpret that. And this slide is giving you also like additional reference to another artist, Fred Wilson, and his interpretation of grief, tears, glass, right? Um, and we can kind of, I can, I just want to acknowledge that, that, that there has been a preface of, you know, what's been done historically um, with lacrimatory, but also artists have been working with glass and with the idea of teardrops but for different contexts. This is my most recent iteration of the glass levels, uh, glass vessels work, and it's currently installed in Atlanta, Georgia. And I titled it, There is a Land Beyond the River, 저 건너 강 언덕에. And this wall installation of 12 teardrops um, hold the Chattahoochee River that I grew up with when I was growing up in Atlanta. And this piece is created in the memory of victims of spa shooting in Atlanta in March uh, 16th, earlier this year. And you know, I, I have such an emotional proximity to this tragedy because I grew up there 
And I grew up in Korean community with these aunties and mothers, right? They looked like my aunties and my mothers. Um, this piece kind of helped me to process that grief and even the rage. But could rage look beautiful? I don't know. But I think I was maybe perhaps exploring that with this piece. Um, the color, the hints of yellow that seems to dominate in my work past four or five years is I refer to not only the beauty of color yellow, but it's definitely I'm referring to racialize the color for Asians in America, right? And also the golden color of bells and the lyrics of Christian hymnal, there is a land beyond the river that we call the sweetness forever. And I reference this because, um, you know, the Korean community in Atlanta especially, the churches are actually the anchors of the immigrant community. And I know, I know for sure, even though these victims may, may not have gone to church, but I believe they might have, um, that they know of those hymnals, right? And they might have sung those hymnals. Um, so the exhibition that Susan has curated at Redux, we are opening this Friday, um, has given me an opportunity to give another iteration of the project that I did at Wave Hill. And, you know, we started envisioning the show two years ago, and um, over time, because we had a lot of time with the pandemic, I got to sort of deep dive a little bit deeper into the kind of work that I wanted to present to Charleston. And because River has kind of entered into my work as kind of new material, I started to research on right, the rivers that run and weave through the city here. Colonial map here and the area views, so luscious and beautiful. And also the southern trees with Spanish moss. Um, Charleston reminds me a lot of Savannah and somehow these trees to me look magnificently beautiful and also extremely tragic. Um, The imagery you're seeing on the left is an image of a montage of a floor vinyl that you will see. It's 16 by 26 feet, and it has, it's a composite of images of all the rivers from Charleston and the personal photos that I have taken from the site visit of the trees and florals that I saw by the nearby park. And on top of it, I'll be installing hand-shredded silk flowers and these are rough sketches, but you know, the installation is gonna look a little different. Um, in 2020, um, there was a really important group show titled Death Becomes Her. It was important to the progression of my work, actually. Um, my work, um, to be included, that's relatively a large scale in a group show is a very unusual situation for me. Um, so I was really grateful that the, um, this place called Brick in Brooklyn gave me that opportunity. And it was my first time using a photo montage in addition to my floor installation. And I also decided to perform inside of my installation. So those two shifts in my work appeared for the first time with this work um, titled, I Wouldn't Know Any Other Way. And then the image of the photo montage you're seeing is my grandmother's garden, and little girl that you're seeing is me when I was like two. Um, and obviously, I'm using color yellow, and it's just kind of thinking about creating a landscape that feels like home for me. Um, and I did duration of performances for multiple days um, in this installation. Um, when I do my work, you know, like, I'm like laying on the floor installation, not moving for hours. Like, what is that? <laughs> you know, often um, when I do the works, I sometimes feel like, am I going nuts? Am I going crazy? Like, you know, am I, you know, sometimes I feel a little aimless, like, and just as if I'm going crazy, you know. Um, so I look at artists um, who became, who came before me, who have done similar works. And so these two images are um, images of Anna Mendiera and Janine and Tony. Um, the image you are seeing on the left is um, a piece by Anna Mendiera. She is covered by wildflowers at a gravesite. 
And Janine and Tony, this title piece uh, titled um, Paper Dance, it was a collaboration with a choreographer named Anna Hoffren, and she used the brown paper to roll her body, and she ended up doing a beautiful choreographic performance, impromptu sort of um, gesture. What I find quite amazing about these two artists and these two images is um, looking into their biographies. Anna Mendieta is from, was, a, was from, is from Cuba, and she was an exile, right? And at the age of 12, she moved to the States. And Ginny and Tony also moved to the States from Bahamas when she was 13. And perhaps there's something that happened in their own sort of biography where rupture occurred. And I really appreciate how they're using their female identifying bodies as a site for trauma and also this location and potentially an agency in which the life can potentially generate, right? Um, so I also am sure you have mentors, teachers, and artists that you really love. And going back to their works and tracing their, not just the works, also personal biographies can assure you um, that you're not alone, because <laughs> often you may feel alone doing this crazy creative journey, right? Um, so in 2019, I did a second collaboration with a choreographer named Lori Stalling. Uh, she was a choreographer in residence at the High Museum in Atlanta. And um, I was invited to do whatever performance I wanted it to do and at the corner of this kind of large floor at the High Museum. And what I did was, and I was thinking about what it means for me to return to my home state, Georgia where I grew up as part of this Asian diaspora in the American South. So over seven days, I sat down with those who are closest to my heart, my nephew and my niece, my mother, friends and their daughters, my teacher, and my former pastor. in visiting, like revisiting the community, right, um, that nurtured me and protected me, I was able to really kind of um, use this institutional space called the museum to put on like this social and also emotional display of the ties that I have with my family, labor, and intimacy that are often invisible in the public space. Here is a collaborative project called Love Song. I've been doing a collaboration with a photojournalist named Dustin Chambers in Atlanta starting in 2018. He's been taking photos of my parents and their home, their church, and the dry cleaners without my presence, because I'm not there anymore. And I've been just responding to the images that the photojournalist is taking in writing. And it's been really a cathartic way for me to process my own story and also their stories to unfold. They're often whispered in dreams and silence. These two images illustrate a community and the joy and support it gives to my immigrant mother. By immigrating here, she has become illiterate to the language and culture, but she still holds herself with a lot of beauty and resilience that I felt like was violated with the shooting back in Atlanta. And again, this, these images, I mean, they were taken you know, back in 2018, um, but they have become really important in my heart and my psyche because it's a reminder of me, um, of the beauty, right, of these aunties and elders in my, my community. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a recent writing that I did a night after the Atlanta shooting. 
I couldn't fall asleep, and I just kind of had to return to the writing for me to process what I was feeling. Um, I use gold, aroma, and young as a reference to the names of three spas where the shooting occurred. Against the dark greenery and a cement building, a fading sign reads, a hypnotic spell I murmured to myself every day going to work. Gold, aroma, and young. And, I, and now, I massage over my loved ones. Not you, fucking bastard, but my loved ones whom I no longer serve. I stroke my daughter, my son, my sister to see if they would feel my warmth. I left it under the seeping light of yellow between the stacked bills and dreams. And I, along with other sisters of mine who left our bodies yesterday, we no longer serve you. We'll now fiercely guard our daughters and granddaughters so that they can have it all of it for themselves, the gold, aroma, and young. Writing and performatively reading these texts um, have become another form that I'm exploring, especially as I consider this particular pursuit of articulating and finding forms to unspoken experiences that's bodily and emotional, right? And I think that this can be an act, right, as a poetic incitement for the narratives that's at the periphery, that's not at the center. Being a writer in residence at Dance Space Project gave me an opportunity to fuse my biography with the other writing with drawings and collages to unveil my context of religiosity and spirituality. Um, having grown up with much zeal in Christianity and how this served as a place where my violent histories of diaspora context could be held. This is an image of a class assignment that I did when I was in graduate school. It's called a replication of my mother's wedding blanket, and it was my very first time being able to kind of put both my cultural context as an image and my material, the silk flowers that I was hand shredding together for the first time. And I'm sharing this as kind of an encouragement that anything that you are exploring at the moment could yield, right? many iterations. It will become your thesis and bigger iterations for years to come if it really is something that spoke very truly to you. And um, so that became my first gallery show, public commission, where my community were able to come and help execute a large scale installation. And you can see that this particular piece titled in a landscape anew from 2012, um, that there's a shift in colors and forms, but all of these works that are from my earlier years of being an artist are extremely opaque. All the colors are very saturated and there's no translucency. And I also see them as a petrified form. Um, so all of these hand shredded silk flowers are not tethered. They're just being carefully laid on top. So if someone were to step on top of it, it will be completely destroyed. But the tension and vulnerability was always the core of my work, right? And when I look at them now, I'm like, oh my gosh, these are like frozen, completely frozen as a form that invites the imagination of rupture and violence. Um, these are images of um, my childhood photo of my grandmother's garden. And this is the very last painting. The image is horrible, but it was my last painting that I did during my senior thesis in my undergraduate years. 
Um, I'm sharing these two images because it always reminds me that at the end of the day, no matter what I'm doing at the moment now, that I was always interested in being able to sort of like tell a story, create a space in which you can enter as if, as how, how I remember it, right? This garden was a place of imagination as a child. Um, I could just like grab pears and grapes out of my grandmother's garden and eat them and I will play on the grounds, right? And it's also the very first place where I experienced a particular loss, seeing the garden completely turning brown um, and not knowing why that world was disappearing in front of my eyes, right? Um, so I constantly go back to that. And you can see now, also, looking at all of my works over the years, that um, I'm kind of going back and forth between the language of abstraction and also figuration. I'm going to share this video. Um, it's going to just play, and I'll just share a little bit. This is a video that I took with my phone of my mother-in-law's garden back in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I spent a month with her as I was doing residency there in June this year. She spent many, many hours there. Every morning before I went off to my studio, I will spend about an hour with her and just basically follow her around. She never made me work, so I could just take photos and chat with her. Um, and as I was re-watching this video, I was really stunned by this liminal space between abstraction and figuration. If you pay really close attention to it, once in a while, my mother-in-law appears on the back, here and there coming in and out of the landscape. And in this betweenness, I'm able to enter a new kind of imagination where my interior sort of landscape that understands like Oh, wow, like it's not a very cerebral understanding of how this feels like for me, but somehow I feel like I'm home and I feel like I can enter and lose myself into this space of beauty and sublime. I don't know if you can see her watering and she just kind of comes out and she disappears again. And I just find that so absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm going to wrap up the lecture with this very short excerpt of a private performance that I did at the installation that I shared at the beginning of the lecture called So We Can Be Near. Um, I decided to do a private performance for two days. And in the excerpt, you will experience a short silence in the beginning and the end. In the middle, you will hear a sound, and it's um, a recording of my humming. When I went up to Narrowsburg to gather Delaware River, I hummed, you know, childhood songs, and this particular song is titled 사랑으로, which means by love, through love. And I grew up singing it, and it was usually sung during farewells. Like, whenever you have to say goodbye to somebody, you'll sing that song. So um, I'm going to just play this uh, short excerpt, and that will be the end of the lecture. And is sound available for this video? Yeah, just wanted to make sure, because the other video didn't have sound when it had. So just want to make sure. Should be up, huh? Great. Awesome. Yeah, okay, great. It will be silent at the beginning. But
Yeah, I think I have it back up, the mic. Um, and we can have light on, too, so I can see you better. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so my question was how you s talked about how yellow in recent years has been a very powerful emotion yeah. and color in your work. Um, before that, you used a lot more color, as mm -hmm. it seemed. Did those colors or any other colors really stand out to you with any, like, great emotion or um, have more meaning to them as yellow does now? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. And I think as an artist, we are very intrigued and we understand what colors do in our mm -hmm. works, right? And um, I think I'm... I'm using them as more as an agency and a tool. Um, meaning, in my work, making works that are beautiful somehow is very important. Someone asked me, why are you, you know, all of your works seem to kind of like have this beauty as a forefront in the work, and, and that means like kind of doing particular things with colors and forms, right? And I kind of had to ask that to myself. And for me, colors, beauty, you know, particular forms act as an agency that holds impossible things. So those colors are not necessarily very emotional for me, actually. Like, for example, I say that yellow is a racialized color. It is, right? Culturally, historically, it's been referenced to sort of like degrade Asians in America. Um, but at the same time, it's really beautiful. 
do I feel particularly attached and it, does it bring like, a, like amazing emotions or sad emotions out of me? Not really. I'm just using them as an agency for me to be able to kind of formulate some sort of something that I'm thinking about, right? Um, and then it becomes like uh, my language, like it becomes my tool. So those beautiful colors that you are seeing in my earlier works, they were directly referencing my mother's wedding blanket. I was leaning onto the cultural sort of um, reference, and then I was using them as my agency again and tool again for me to sort of like bring that into the public. And to me, those bright colors are very accessible to people, and they can kind of enter into my work because it's saying, I am yellow, <laughs> right? And look at these all of yellow colors, and people kind of naturally sort of get drawn to that, and there I start to find then ways to sort of like, yeah, further my aesthetics in my work, but also deeper conversations that deals with identity and trauma and all of those things. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. that question, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk about how time plays into your performance practice? What, what is the significance of time, and how do you determine the duration of your performances? Yeah, what a great question. And time is very present in my work, right? I don't think it was intentional, but my, my work in general, whether it is the labor aspect of making the work, installing the work, and then also my performances ended up being very durational, and I asked that why. I think it comes from, one is like, I lose myself, so I lose a sense of time, so I don't know how long it passes, <laughs> so that's part of it, but I think, I think durational aspect of time, days and months or hours kind of idea, right, is, um, I think I want to emphasize or I want to be very specific about letting myself and other folks know that in my work that this emotional labor has been measured, right, and that I want that to be acknowledged. And um, how unforgiving and how relentless and endless that emotional labor is, right, in the work that I do. So in the performances, I usually set like, oh, it's going to be two days, it's going to be seven days, or it's going to be eight hours. I don't know how I actually make those decisions, but it's very intuitive. I'm like looking at the sites, and I just would know that I think it's going to be an eight-hour commitment all day long. Or if the site allows me to be there multiple days, then I would give myself, depending on how my body feels also, that... Um, that I just would know. And I would also, after one day performance, I feel like I need to revisit and do it one more time, then I'll do that. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Anyone else? OK. <laughs> We have one more, one more. <laughs> and I'm also happy to hang if you guys want to talk afterwards. I was trying to figure out a way to like say this and to make sense, but yeah. sort of going off the time thing, like your process, yeah. what is your mindset in that, that, that like, what's your frame of mind? What's going through your head? How are you processing it all? Yeah. Is there a sort of out-of-body experience? Or how, what, what goes on? <laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I actually asked that exact same question to my mentor, whose work is also very labor-intensive. I'm like, Jean, what goes in your psyche? I know that I, I kind of go through the same thing. And I was really curious what she goes through. And she kind of. I, she kind of, da, da, da. Um, but anyway, I, you know, when I just cut hours and hours of the, you know, 
silk flowers or when I'm just laying down on the floor for hours. Um, I think it's two things. Like, it's not as mysterious as you think, right? Like, I just, it's like meditation sort of, like, you just lay down and you start to sort of go through, like, initial sort of bunch of, like, stuff, you know, oh, what did I do yesterday, or what am I going to eat, or am I hungry, like, these kind of mundane things kind of goes through all of my body and psyche, but what's nice about the duration of pieces, right, also, like, as well as my process and the performance, um, once you enter into maybe, like, second, third, fourth hour or the day, you kind of go to the other side, and it's difficult to under express, but the best example that I can give is um, when I was a little girl, I was always very much attuned to something that was bigger than myself. And I don't know why, but I played the piano and I used to sneak into the church that I used to go to in the neighborhood when nobody was there. I would just play for like seven hours as a little girl. I just was able to enter into this kind of like the other side because I think my body, my psyche, just knew that I needed that, right? So I think my duration of pieces tend to sort of like go to that trance sort of state um, at times, but it's not like that all the time, right? So I think there's a myth that we create with these performances and artists, and it's partially true, but another big part of it is it's work, you know? Like you have to stretch the canvas and get the materials and carry them and priming them, it's all work, you know? So things that I do in the studio and the performances, it's also just work, you know? Um, so, yeah, so that's how I, yeah, <laughs> great. All right, one more question here, hi. Thank you for these really thoughtful questions. It also helps me to process some things about my practice. Hey, I was also trying to figure out how to say this exactly, but your work theme is kind of like a garden and your presence within it. Do you ever think about like the presence of other things like insects and I kind of picture like when you're talking about land and like whose land is it? Um, I feel like that could really work in well with what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I think... You know, what's been really nice and we just talked about it with Hannah and Susan, just us being able to look back. Like we've been out of school a little over 10 years now and we are able to look back and kind of see the threads of in our work, right? And for me, that's a really great question because as I think about many of these things, there are more things that I can put into the work, right? By me being open and being curious. And something that hasn't entered is the ecology of other living things. Right. Um, what's interesting now is silk flowers has been such an obsession, and now I'm transferring. I feel like I'm transferring that energy and focus to river water, and you know what happened at Wave Hill? The river water is actually a living thing, and over the time of six weeks of exhibition, the sediments were building up at the bottom of the glass vessels. That's the evidence of life. Right, And so I feel like I'm just entering into that. Um, and what's encouraging is like, oh, maybe next to 10 years, 10 years will be river water and maybe, you know, some other living things outside of myself, right? Kind of, um, I think a lot of what you may be doing is kind of self-referential works, self-portraits and Maybe not, but I did that. Everything was so self-referential. I needed it to figure out who I was as a person and as an artist. Um, but now I'm finally feeling like I can kind of step outside of that just a little bit. So maybe insects in five years. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, I think that's yeah, it. I think thank these you. are really beautiful. Yeah, thank, thank you, so you so much. much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'll stick around if anybody wants to. Yeah, but you're completely dismissed. At the, yeah, <laughs> class dismissed.